Hello everyone, this is Danish Vlog and this is going to be the soft spoken video that I mentioned last night and I'm thinking it's gonna be kinda hard on my throat but we'll see how it goes. Um, at the moment I am rendering the new video that I, or to you guys it's not new, but the video about the Oscars is rendering right now. And I've been spending the past hour researching the Danish royal family now. And 
skiers and stuff like that. But yeah, um, in Denmark we have a constitutional monarchy. And this is also why I needed to look up the words because I had no idea how to say that in English. But it means that um, the, um, the queen or whoever is the current monarch or reigning whatever, um, just I'm going to read this, is limited to non-partisan ceremonial functions and um, uh, She really has nothing to say. She's just a, the current queen, yeah. you know, she's just a face. And um, she has basically ceremonial functions, like I said. She, she doesn't have any real power. Um, yeah. Um, the Kingdom of Denmark, um, which is according to Wiki, simply, norm normally, commonly known simply as Denmark, consists of um, three semi-independent semi regions, um, one of which is Denmark, the second is the Faroe Islands, um, and the third is Greenland, um, which according to Wiki is in North America, but yeah, so the relationship of the member states is referred to as what we call Rysfelskabel. I don't think that's translatable, but both Greenland and the Faroe Islands are represented in the Danish parliament, um, which we call Folketingel. The Folketing consists of 179 seats. Um, according to Wiki, these are just things that I'm reading to you guys right now. Two out of these seats are elected by Greenland and two by the Faroe Islands. This is roughly proportional represent represent representation as the total population of Greenland and Faroe Islands is about 1.9% of the total population of the Kingdom. Even though the Kingdom of Denmark is a single sovereign state, only the nation of Denmark is the member a member of the European Union. Now that was just a bit of... Now we have that. <laughs> Sorry. I think this is going to be a very random video, but... I hope you enjoy it. Okay. I really should have just read this a bit more specific, but I'm really not too strong on the whole politics um, in Denmark, which I should be, but not at least not this part of it, like what role the queen has and that so if you want to check it out you can just google monarchy of Denmark and then there's this little part about what it means that the Queen has a constitutional rule but yeah um, history of, of the like the Danish monarchy and um, the thing about the Danish monarchy is that it's the second oldest continual monarchy in the world still existing today and the number one the oldest monarchy continual monarchy is japan um of course there are monarchies existing monarchies that are older but they are not continual which means that they are not from one line of you know genes <laughs> if that makes sense um the monarchy itself is more than two, a thousand years old and yeah uh, the dum 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 I'm just reading a bit of random stuff here 
that I don't really think is very important right now. Bum, bum, bum. The Danish royal family has members of, or has like, um, are related to a lot of the other royal families in Europe, but I'm gonna go into that later, so I'm not gonna talk too much about it right now. Um, right now, um, we have a, um, queen, as most of you know, Queen Margaret II, or Tonning Margrethe den Enden. And, um, she has reigned since sometime in the 70s, but I'm gonna go into that later again. And, um, here is some rules about the succession, like whether or not you're allowed to succeed to the throne after your parent dies, whatever. I'm not really good at this, I can tell. But, um, dynasts, if that's a word, lose their right to the throne if they marry without the permission of the monarch given in the council of state. Whatever that means. I think that means that they have to get, like, when the current crown prince was to be married to his wife, Mary, um, he had to ask his mom for permission, and of course she gave it. I think that's basically just a formal thing they have to do. And then the monarch of Denmark must be a member of the Danish National Church, um, or Evangelical Lutheran Church of Denmark. We've talked about this before, and I'm not going to go into religion again. Um, but yeah, that's apparently, um, like, a deal breaker. <laughs> if, if, the, if the crown prince suddenly decided he wanted to be a Buddhist, then he couldn't become the king of Denmark. But I highly doubt he's going to decide to do that. Um... Blah, blah, blah. And then there's something about some different titles that I'm not going to go into. And, yeah. Now I think I'm going to start talking about the list of Danish monarchs. Because, yeah, let's face it, that's the history part of it. And that's the geeky part of it. And a lot of you guys are listening to this to fall asleep, so this will be pretty boring, I guess, if you're not really into this stuff. So, I hope it helps you fall asleep. <laughs> like I said, the monarchy of Denmark is more than a thousand years old. And, um, continual monarchy of Denmark, whatever. And I have here, um, a list, you can find it on wiki, um, of all of the kings and queens in Denmark. Like, make it sound like we have a lot of queens that, like, are the ruler of the country, but that's not the case. We only have two. Um, of course we have a lot of queens, but, um, they don't, they're like, well, how is that? It's really weird that when a king is married or a prince is married, he his wife speak, wife becomes a queen. But if a crown princess marries a, a random boy or a prince, for that matter, um, he becomes a, pr a prince when she becomes a king. Well, never mind. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but <laughs> oh god, I'm rambling so much. Yeah, the first king of Denmark was a Viking. <laughs> and his name was Gorm the Old. Or Gorm, Gorm Dengamle. And he reigned from 
936 to 958 and this is of course um, after Christ AC no? I don't know what you, how you say that in English but of course this is after the birth of Christ after we started like never mind again this is just not relevant but of course it's um, yeah shut up but yeah go on the old and um i actually don't know why he's counting as the first king let's find out i just click his name here let's see oh it's rendered 39 percent go on the old also called gorm the sleepy was the first Historically recognized king of Denmark. Blah blah. He ruled from uh, Yelling, which is a town in Denmark, and he made the oldest of the Yelling stones in honor of his wife, Tua. And I already knew that, and I'm just gonna talk about that, but yeah, he was the first recognized king as we just learned so that's why he's gone kind as of the first king of Denmark there was probably a lot of like random viking kings all over Denmark before that and then he gathered it or something like that um, he like I said he was a viking he had so he believed in like Thor and all of those what are they called? The Norse gods. Um he wasn't a Christian and he had two sons and he wanted his firstborn, Knut, I think was his name, to be um the king, but unfortunately he died, so it had to be um, his second son, Harold Bluetooth, <laughs> or Halblatten, and um, he became the second king of, king of Denmark. A funny story that I actually just learned googling all of this today is that um, Gorm the Old so wanted his first king, to, son to be king of Denmark after he died that he wouldn't, he said, it is told that he said that he wouldn't, he would kill anyone who told him that his son was dead. And so both of his sons being Vikings were raiding, um, pillaging England at the time and they went out and in war stuff like that. I am so not making sense. I'm embarrassed at how insecure I am but yeah and um the firstborn born son died um during one of those raids and so Harold um came home to tell his dad that his brother had died but he dared not tell him so he told his mother who would not be the one to tell Gorm either so she demanded that the entire castle was in mourning and um, had black drapes covering the windows and all that kind of stuff and so when the king came so, and he came inside and he saw that the state of Denmark was in mourning. He said, what has happened here or something like that? And then he said, oh no, when she told him, the queen told him a story about something about, no, a couple of birds. He had two birds, one white and one gray, and they were out in the world. And then the Brits or... Saxons or wherever they were fighting 
caught the white bird and killed it and took off all its white feathers so that it was useless useless to him anymore. And so the king said, Oh no, Knut, my son, is dead. And the queen said, You said that to him and I didn't and so no one told the king that his son was had died he said it himself and he didn't kill anyone for saying it <laughs> oh my god so on to the next king I'm not gonna mention all of the kings cause that's gonna take too long but I'm just gonna mention the ones that I remember from my history classes and the ones that are worth mentioning. Um, the next king, as I said, was his second son, Harold Bluetooth, or Halblatten, and he reigned from 958 to 985-86, and he was the first Christian king of Denmark. I don't exactly remember the year or whatever, but he um, converted to Christianity from believing in the Norse gods, and while doing so, he made the second yelling stone, like I mentioned before. They are with runes on them, and um, they say something along the lines something about the father and honoring him and something about converting to Christianity and stuff like that. And he had his father reburied in a church instead of buried um, the old way like they did when they believed in the Norse gods. So yeah, that's kind of funny. And also a random fact. You might be thinking, oh, his name is Harold Bluetooth. That sounds familiar. And that's not very weird. Because, this is just, I'm reading this directly off of Wiki. Bluetooth now more commonly refers to the Bluetooth wireless specification designed by Ericsson to enable cable-free connections between computers, mobile phones, PDAs, printers, etc. Bluetooth in these devices is named after this king. The Bluetooth logo consists of the Nordic runes for his initials, H and B. Um, Harold is regarded as having united dissonant tribes in Denmark in parts of Norway and southern Sweden under a single king. So that's why they used Bluetooth as the name of wireless Bluetooth. Yeah. Random fact of the day. So that was a bit about him. And so the Yelling Stones um, is really a um, trademark of Denmark and a lot of people outside of Denmark know about them as well, and they were actually um, disgraced, if that's the right word, um, not so long ago, like a week or two ago, when a young kid um, spray painted them, and right now they're trying to figure out how to get the spray paint off, but bad, bad youth. Then we have a couple of other kings, and in the year 1018 to 1035, Knut the Great ruled over Denmark. And what can we learn about him? He was the king of Denmark, England, and Norway, and parts of Sweden. So that's how big Denmark has been, and it's actually been even bigger. Um. Yeah, but he reigned parts of England, um, as far as I can tell, and again, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it was because Denmark for centuries had been um, tormenting England and and um, the British island, Islands or Isles or whatever, and then um, he 
took over England and and he said that he could keep the Vikings away. Surprise, surprise, because he controlled the white Vikings. And so he became a king of England. Let's just see. Yeah. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Again, I'm not quite sure that's... In the summer of 1015, Knut's fleet set sail for England with a Danish army of perhaps 10,000 in 200 longships. Knut was at the head of an array of Vikings from all over Scandinavia. The invasion force was to be in often close and grisly warfare with English, the English for the next 14 months. months. Practically all of the battles were fought against Aethelred's son, Edmund Ironside. And then there's a lot of blah blah blah. The Danish conquest of England completed. On the 18th of October 1016, as the Danes retired towards the ships, they were engaged, engaged by Edmund's army, leading to the Battle of Asandun the site of which may have been either Ashington in southeast or Ashton in northwest Essex. In the ensuing struggle, blah, 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 blah. Um, through intermediaries, Knut and Edmund agreed to come to a negotiation settlement, and on an island near Deerhurst they made peace dividing the kingdom between them. All of England, north of the Thames, was to be the domain of the Danish prince, because he wasn't king at the time, while all of the south was kept by the English king, along with London. Edmund died on the 30th of November, within weeks of this agreement. The circumstances of his death are unknown. In accord with his treaty with Ironside, Knut was left as king of England. His coronation was in London at Christmas, with recognition by the nobility in January the next year as at Oxford. So he was actually king of England before he was the king of Denmark. Blah blah, this is not very interesting. Blah 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 blah. Then there was... Canute the fourth, Canute fourth, the holy, or Canute den Heli. and he is actually one of the kings I remember from my history classes. Well, the ones I mentioned before I remember as well, but his story stands out to me. He reigned for six years from 1080 to 1086 and he um like i said he was Knut the holy and um the reason i remember his story is because of his death um he died a martyr death um a lot of peasants or he had to for some reason that i don't remember he had to flee and he fled to Ulse, which is a city in Denmark, and he hid inside a wooden church. And some rebels stormed into the church and um, slaughtered or slew, I don't know if that's the same, Knut, along with his brother and 17 of their followers before the altar. And um, this martyr death resulted in him being canonized, um, yeah, by the Catholic Church. So that's why he became known as Knut the Holy. Yeah, funny story, huh? And then we move along, down, 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 to the first. Um, Veldemar. Veldemar the Great, or Veldemar den Stor. And he 
he's also one of the, the, the ones that I remember. We have several Veldemars, but this one is the first. And no one, no idea why he was called the Great. But no, that was not what he was called, was it? Oh, it was. It was. He was called Madame the Great. And I think it was partially. Oh, yeah, he was his. I believe he was his brother. I have to just look here. No, not his brother. But he worked along with a um, um, bishop called Absalom, who was later known as the founder of Copenhagen, which is today is um, the capital of Denmark. Yeah, so I'm not really going to go into too much more detail about this, but I think there was something about, oh, now I remember, now I remember. He had to share the kingdom of Denmark with two of his brothers, and uh, after their father died, and where he was murdered, and let's see if I'm just remembering this right, you know, rightly or correctly. Uh, blah blah. There, yeah, the pretenders to the throne were Sw Swain the Third or something. And Knut the Fifth. And of course, Veldemar. And so, in um, 1157, the three agreed to part the country into three among themselves, and blah blah blah. He, some of them were killed. Oh, someone enlarged an invasion of, upon... Valdemar and he was defeated. That was Sven. He was killed during a flight. And so Valdemar consequently outlived his rival pretenders and became the sole king of Denmark. Yay. And Valdemar's reign saw the rise of Denmark which reached its zenith under his second song, Valdemar the Second. And we're gonna talk about him in just a bit. Oh god, I hope this is just at least relaxing. Yeah, then Valdemar the Second, he wasn't the king right after um, Valdemar the Great, but he was the king after that, so, no, oh, never mind, oh god, this video sucks, I think, anyway, Valdemar the second is also known as Valdemar the Victorious, or in Danish, Valdemar Saya, and he reigned from 1202 to, I just got, wait, yeah, to 1241, He's called, like I said, Valdemar the Victorious or Valdemar the Conqueror. Uh, he was blah blah blah. And his nickname was a later invention that was not used during the king's own lifetime. And that's very normal. Blah 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 blah. Okay, yeah. So. He reigned Denmark and parts of Germany, parts of Sweden and parts of Norway and even parts of Latvia or if that's what it's called. I can't remember. Anyway. Um he yeah, I think it was during his reign that Denmark owned uh, or was it the biggest? It was a big country. Um, because, like I said, they had parts of Norway, Sweden, Germany, and they had Denmark, and they had parts of 
like Eastern Europe as well. So, and then there was um, the Battle of Lindanis. Lindanis. I don't know how to say that. Um, but that was when the I didn't mean Latvia. I meant Estonia. Sorry. Basically the same thing. No, I know. I know it's not. I'm just joking. Anyway, Estonia. But um, where he had a crusade, um, Valdemar, and when the army landed in Estonia, near Tallinn, or today's Tallinn, um, the chiefs of this is one of the stories I remember as well from my history classes because it's the story of how the Danish flag was born. <laughs> but yeah, the chiefs of the Estonia sat down with the Danes and agreed to acknowledge, acknowledge the Danish king as their overlord. A few of them allowed themselves to be baptized, which seemed to be a good sign. Three days later, on the 5th of June, 1219, while the Danes were sorry, I should have put my phone to silent. I'm just going to do that now, just a second. And I did. Um, where was I? Three days later, on the 5th of June, 1219, while the Danes were attending Mass, Thousands of Estonians broke into the Danish camp from all sides. Confusion reigned and things looked bad for the Valdemar's crusade. Luckily for him, um, Vitsla of Gruggen gathered his men in a second camp and attacked the Estonians from the rear. During the Battle of Lindanis, or however that's pronounced, um, the legend says that whenever Bishop Sunusen raised his arms, the Danish Danes surged forward, and when his arms grew tired and he let them fall, the Estonians turned the Danish Danes back. Attendants rushed forward to raise his arms once again, and the Danes surged forward again. At the height of the battle, Bishop Sunsen prayed for a sign, and it came in the form of a red cloth with a white cross, which drifted down from the sky just as the Danes began to fall back. A voice was heard to say, When this banner is raised on high, you shall be victorious. The Danes surged forward and won the battle. At the end of the day, thousands of Estonians lay dead on the field, and Estonia was added to the Danish realm. Estonians were forcibly baptized as Christians. Valdemar ordered the construction of a great fortress at um, Rival, near the site of the battle. Eventually, a city grew around the hilltop castle, which is still called Tal Tallinn, Tallinn, um, which means Danish castle slash town in the Estonian language. Hmm, I didn't know that. The red banner with the white cross called Danibu has been the national flag of the Danes since 1919. Uh, Danibu is Europe's oldest flag. Um, this sign still in modern use. So that's why I remember King Valdemar II. It was because it was a time when Denmark was a big country and it was the time when Denebo was born, or however that is said. So, the next king that I remember, sorry, and that I'm going to mention, 
we have some more Velimars and blah blah blah. And then we have Velimar, the fourth call or Velima at a day. And let's just have a look at him. Uh, blah blah blah. did something. I'm just gonna under, I believe, hit the king that re reigned before Valdemar Ettore. Valdemar Ettore. Um, Denmark went bankrupt and was mortgaged out in parcels. And then this king, Valdemar Ettore, sought to repay the debt and reclaim the lands of Denmark. And so that's what he's known for. He's trying to take back the parts of um, Denmark that we lost, um, that we have to had to give away. He wasn't entirely successful, but he still got some of it back, as far as I can tell. And if you want to read more details about this, you can just go into the link. I'm gonna link these three pages um, that I'm looking at right now so that you can see the lists of the kings and stuff like that. Mm. And just to read a bit about his legacy. King Valdemar Edade, Valdemar Edade was a pivotal figure in Danish, or pivotal, I don't know how to say that word, figure in Danish history. He gradually reacquired the lost territories that had been added to Denmark over the centuries. His heavy-handed methods, endless taxation, and usurpation, or usurpation of rights long held by noble families led to uprising throughout Valdemar's reign. Oh, he was maybe one of those that took some, yeah, took some rights from the noble families. Oh, that wasn't a good thing. What well, was a good thing? Of course, it was a good thing, but um, it must not have been uh, a good thing. Like he must have been quite unpopular with the nobles. That was what I was trying to say. His attempt to recreate Denmark as a power in Northern Europe was welcomed by the Danes in the beginning, but Valdemar's policies met with bitter opposition by the great landed families of Jutland, um, probably the nobles. He expanded the powers of the king based upon his military powers, provis, or whatever, and the loyal nobility that became the foundation of Danish rulers until 1440. Many foreigners uh, were appointed as court officials and counselors. The most important of them was the German Slavic nobleman Henning Pulbusk, who was Dost, parentheses, parentheses, blah 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 blah, something with parentheses, prime minister. Uh, Valdemar the Fourth, or Valdemar Erde, um is often regarded as one of the most important of all Danish medieval kings. The sources give the impression of an intelligent, cynical, reckless, and clever Machiavellian ruler with a talent for both politics and economy. He was succeeded by his grandson, um, Old II of Denmark, the offspring of his daughter Margaret and Hukon the Sixth of Norway, son of I was the second of Sweden. It's all inbred <laughs> here in Scandinavia. We're inbred, all of us. His nickname, Edade, is usually interpreted as day again. It's literal meaning in Danish, indicating that he brought new hope to the realm after the dark period of bad kingship. The epith... That... That has also been suggested as a misinterpretation of the middle low German phrase Teatage these days, which can best be interpreted as what times we live in. Many stories, ballads, and poems have been made about Valdemar. 
He was reinvented as one of the Danish hero kings during the mid-19th century when Denmark was fighting Germany for its traditional southern Jutland region. Okay, so maybe he wasn't the one battling the nobles. I don't know. I don't want to go too much into that. Um, actually, because I don't... That's part of the history lesson that I didn't really find interesting. Which is probably kind of stupid, but... Yeah. How long is my video? Oh, more than 50% has rendered, and this video is now 45 minutes long. Yay. Then there is the first Margaret, um, queen, the first queen, and I don't know too much about her. I think she was queen because her son was too young to become king, and so she reigned for him, but then he died, um, at a very young age, and she just continued reigning. Oh, the king before, I just mentioned before, Valdemar Adede. Um, he ruled from 1340 to 1375, I don't think I said that, but Margaret, she ruled from 1376 to 1412, and yeah, she, I think she was a very loved queen from what I remember and from what I've just read, again I'm not going to go into too much detail, but at the time she wasn't called Margaret the first because nobody expected there to be a second but after we got our current queen she was named Margaret the first. Oh that was my finger I'm so sorry. And then we have a lot of different kings and then I'm just looking down here because I want to be able to remember yeah then we have Christian the first. Uh, I just have to read a bit here. Because I want to see if I can maybe... Just maybe learn a bit about something before I start talking about it too much. Not this. Maybe. Oh, why can't I just remember to check this kind of stuff before I start talking about it. Anyway. messed up. Sorry. Maybe it was with this king. Or just because I'm just trying to figure out when we were, when they made it an absolute monarchy. Because I know I figured that out. Oh, no, I messed up again. It wasn't with him. Maybe it was with Maybe it was with... No. Just hang in there, people. I'm gonna figure this one out. Then maybe it was with... My finger is shaking. I hope you can't hear that. Oh, you know, I'll, I'll delete the video of this because it's really random, so you'll just probably get to like a Danish flag or something like that. Anyway.
then in 1448 we start um, on the whole right now uh, we have a queen called Margaret but before that we have only had kings and queens called Christian and Fulick and that started with this king Christian the first on uh, in 1948 Blah 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 blah. 1448. Um, so he was the first Christian, and then there was a single John, and then after him there was a Christian again, Christian the second, and then came Frederick the first, and then he just went Frederick Christian, Frederick Christian, and so on. If that makes sense. So that's kind of a tradition. Now I'm just gonna look here, see if I can find what I was talking about, or not talking about because I don't want to go too much into it if I don't have the details. I hope my phone or my camera is gonna keep on going. But. Um, in 1588 to 1648, there was Christian the Fourth, um, and he was the longest reigning monarch of Denmark, and still is, and he is frequently remembered as one of the most remarkable Danish kings, having initiated many reforms and projects. Um, had a couple of wars and legacy. Um, when Christian was crowned king, Denmark uh, held a supremacy over the Baltic Sea, which was lost to Sweden during the years of his reign. Nevertheless, Christian attained a legacy of great popularity with the people as one of the few kings from the House of Oldenburg. As such, he featured in the Danish national play, Ilvahoy. Furthermore, his great building activities also furthered his popularity. Um, Christian IV was a good linguist, speaking besides his native tongue, German, Latin, French, and Italian. Naturally cheerful and hospitable, he delighted in the lively society but he was also passionate, irritable, and sensual. He had courage, a vivid sense of duty, and indefatigable, whatever that means, love of work, and all the inquisitive seal and inventive energy of a born reformer. His own pleasure, whether it took form of love or ambition, ambition was always his first consideration. In the heyday of his youth, his high spirits and passion for adventure enabled him to surmount every obstacle with Elam, but in the decline of life he reaped the bitter fruits of his lack of self-control and sank into the grave of weary and broken-hearted old man. Wow, that's terrible. He founded a large number of towns and buildings in his countries. These include uh, Christianshavn, Christiania, now Oslo, modern, modern day capital of Norway, founded after a fire destroyed the original city in 1624, Klukstad, founded as a rival to Hamburg, Christianstad and Christiansand, two short-lived towns were Christian Pries in Schleswig near Kiel and Christian Christianopil near the Swedish border. Two settlements were constructed for industrial purposes: Kongsberg in Norway to a mine a silver deposit and Kopermulle in Kormulle in Schleswig as a copper mill. Christian's best-known buildings include the Observatory Runeton, the Stock Exchange, Börsen, 
the Copenhagen Fortress Castilla, Rosenborg Castle, Workers District, Nubola, the Copenhagen Naval Church of Holmen, Holmenskirke, Proviantgården, a brewery, um, two Trinity churches in Copenhagen and modern Christian style now known as respectively Trinitatis Church and Holy Trinity Church. Chris Christian converted Flexball Castle to a Renaissance palace and completely rebuilt Kronborg Castle to a fortress. He also founded the Danish East India Company inspired by the similar Dutch company. company. So, yeah. And I think he had a lot of um, children with a lot of different ladies. <laughs> so, I'm just going to look at the next king in line. Which, oh, this is what I was looking for. Frederick III, Ella Frederick den was king of Denmark. And Norway from 1648 until his death, which was in 1670, and is instituted Denmark as an absolute monarchy, monarchy in 1660. Um, and that means an absolute monarchy. I don't know what it was before. I have no idea. Uh, it is a monarchy form of government government where the monarch 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 exercises ultimate governing authority as head of state and head of com government thus wielding political power over the sovereign state and its subject people in an absolute monarchy the transmissions of power is twofold hereditary and marital marital Whatever. As absolute governor, the monarch's authority is not legally bound or restricted by a constitution, as in a limited monarchy. In theory, the absolute monarch dis exercises total power over the land and its subject peoples, yet in practice, the monarchy is counterbalanced by political groups from among the social classes and castes of the realm, the aristocracy clergy, uh, bourgeois, and proletarians. Some monarchies have powerless or symbolic parliaments and other go governmental bodies that the monarch can alter or dissolve at will. Despite effectively being absolute monarchies, they are technically constitutional monarchies due to the existence of a constitution and national and canon of law. Blah blah blah. Denmark was turned into an absolute monarchy. So that was Frederick the Third of Denmark, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about why he did it and all of that stuff because that you can find out for yourself. And now I'm just going through a lot of Christians and a lot of Fredericks. Then we have, just let's take a look at a long line of absolute monarchists. And not this one. I'm really just looking at trying to find out when we stopped. Being <laughs> I but this is so ridiculous because I I will hear it was Frederick the seventh of Denmark reigned from eighteen forty eight until his death in eighteen sixty three. He was the last Danish monarch of the old royal branch of the House of Oldenburg, and also the last king of Denmark to rule as an absolute monarch. During his rule, he signed a constitution that established a Danish parliament and made the country a constitutional monarchy, which is what we are today. 
yeah. He managed to make himself one of the most loved, beloved of the Danish kings of recent time. This was probably due to his giving up absolutism, but also to his personality, in spite of many weaknesses confirmed by his contemporaries, drinking, eccentric behavior, etc. He also possessed something of a gift as an actor. He could be both folksy and genuinely hearty, being able to appear as a simple yet dignified monarch. During his many travels throughout Denmark, he cultivated his contact with the common man. He was also a keen antiquarian, and according to the later Danish archaeologist P. V. Club, uh, Klub, he was, um, it was he more than anyone else who helped to arouse the wide interest in Danish antiquities. Blah blah blah. So yeah, he was the last. Um, um, absolute monarch. And that was in, yeah, never mind. And then came Christian the Ninth, also known as the Grand, the father in law of Europe, as his six children married into other royal houses. Uh, he reigned from 1863 to 1906, yeah, where he died. Let's just uh, find out which of his children married off to, yeah. Four of his children sat on the thrones either as monarchs or as, co as a consort of Denmark, the United Kingdom, Russia, and Greece. A fifth daughter, Tua, would have become Queen of Hanover had her husband's throne not been abolished before his reign began. The great dynastical success of the sixth children was to a great extent not the favor of um, Christian the Ninth himself, himself, but due to the dynastical ambitions of his wife, Louise of Hesse-Kassel. Some have compared her to compare, compared her dynastical capabilities with those of Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom. Christian's grandsons included Nicholas II of Russia, Constantine I of Greece, George V of the United Kingdom, Christian X of Denmark, and Håkon VII of Norway. He was, in the last years of his life, named Europe's father-in-law. Today, most of Europe's reigning and ex-reigning royal families are direct descendants of Christian the Ninth. There is a story that, while on an outing with his children and their families, they happened across a lost man whom they helped to find his way. Upon reaching the road, the man inquired as to the identities of Christian and his family. Christian replied truthfully, stating the names and titles of all present. Not believing Christian, but instead taking it in humor, he proclaimed himself to be Jesus Christ before thanking them and departing. That's a fun story. Anyway, yeah, that was Christian. Life. I think it's quite interesting how all, how all of the royal families are related due to this man and how we had... Well, we, I'm not saying we, but then the Danish royal family have had connections to Russia and England and you know, pretty much all of the surrounding countries. And that's back to the whole inbred thing I was talking about. But then we have... Um, just looking at... We had, have Frederick the Eighth. He reigned from 1906 to 1912, so only six years. I have no idea who he is. He was the eldest son of King Christian. Uh, oh, he died. That was why. Yeah, blah, blah. That's why he only had six years of reigning. Anyway, that was not very interesting. Then we come on to one of my favorite kings, even though I, of course, did not live while he lived, but Christian X 
who range from 1912 to eight to to 1974. Not no, not 74, of course not. 47. So he reigned during both world wars, which is why he was very loved by the people. Um. I'm just gonna go to why he was so loved. Yeah, in contrast to his brother, King Hakon VII of Norway and Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands, who went into exile during the Nazi occupation of their countries, Christian X remained in his capital throughout the occupation of Denmark, being to the Danish people a visible symbol of the national cause. Although this is imp it is important to note that Norway's King Hakon VII was forced to escape the invading Germans after refusing to accept a Nazi-friendly puppet regime. During the Nazi occupation, Nazi occupation, occupation, I can't speak, Christian's official speeches were often a little more than echoing of the government's official policy of cooperation with the occupying forces. This does not, did not prevent him from being seen as a man of mental resistance. In spite of his age and the precarious situation he took, a daily ride on his horse, jubilee through his city, not accompanied by a groom, let alone by a guard. While acknowledging the greetings from the Danish population, he would studiously ignore the punctilious salutes of German military personnel. So that was why he was loved. He um, set an example for the common Dane. In 1942, Adolf Hitler sent the king a long telegram congratulating him on his 72nd birthday. The king replied telegram King's reply tra telegram was a mere meinen besten Dank. Um, in English, my best thanks, King Christian. This perceived and no doubt deliberate uh, slight greatly outraged, uh, outraged Hitler and he immediately call recalled his ambassador from Cop Copenhagen and expelled the Danish ambassador for, from Denmark. German pressure also resulted in the dismiss dismissal of the government led by Wilhelm Buhl and his replacement with a new cabinet led by non-party members and veteran diplomat Erich Scavenius, who the German expected would be more cooperative. After the fall, a fall with his horse in, uh, on the 19th of October 1942, King Christian was more or less invalid for the rest of his reign. The role he had played in creating the Easter crisis, did, what, I don't know what that is, had greatly reduced his popularity, but his obvious disdain for the American Wehrmacht, um, day rides, and the telegram crisis had once again made him popular to the point of being a beloved national symbol. In the air, then we come to legend and trivia. In the early 1980s, uh, the International Herald Tribune ran a full-page advertisement for, um, this is not relevant, blah blah blah, I'm not gonna go through that. Yeah. Um, it's something about the David Star, but that was never, um, it wasn't something the Jews had to wear in Denmark. But, this attribution of support is blah blah blah, however, as the yellow badge was never introduced in Denmark, it originated in a conversation, the story behind this, originated in a conversation between the king and his minister of finance, Wilhelm Buhl, during which Christian remarked that if the German administration tried to introduce the symbol of the Star of David in Denmark, then perhaps uh, we should all wear it, he said. He is supposed to have said. King Christian used to ride through the streets of Copenhagen unaccompanied, while the people stood and waved to him. One apocry apocryphal story relates that one day a German soldier m remarked to a young boy that he found it odd that the king would ride with no bodyguard. The boy reportedly replied, All of Denmark is his bodyguard. 
This story was recounted in Nathaniel Benchley's best-selling book, Bright Candles, as well as in Louis Lowry's book, Number the Stars. The contemporary patriotic song, Der Rider en Konge, Der Rides a King, centers on the king's rides. In this song, the narrator replies to a foreigner's inquiry about the king's lack of regard, that he is our freest man, and that the king isn't shielded by a physical force, but that hearts guard the king of Denmark. Another popular legend is the one of the flag on Emelienborn. The Germans wouldn't let the king fly the Danish flag as it at his castle, and told him that if it wasn't taken down, the Germans would send a soldier to take it down. The king replied that if that was the case, he would send a Danish soldier to raise it again. The Germans replied that they would shoot that soldier, and the king replied that so Danish soldier will be me. And throughout the war, the Danish flag flew at Emelienborn. A popular way, blah blah blah, that's not relevant. <laughs> yeah, so, and he died in 1947 making the way for another really popular king of Denmark, um, our current queen's dad, Frederick the Ninth. He reigned from 1947 to his death in 1972. And um, he was also very popular in Denmark. As far as I know, of course, I wasn't born, but, yeah, legacy. Uh, Frederick's reign saw great change. During these days, Danish society shook off the restrictions of an agricultural society and developed a welfare state, welfare state. and as a con consequence of the booming booming economy of the 1960s, women entered the labor market. In other words, Denmark became a modern country, which meant new demands on the monarchy. Shortly after the king has delivered his New Year's address to the nation, 1971-72, turn of the year, he fell ill. On his passing 14 days later in a Melbourne castle, palace, sorry, uh, he died. And let's just see, there is something, he changed something, well he didn't, but we'll just go back and find out. Because after he died, of course, the current queen took over, and that was Margaret the, th the second, or Magrede, the M. And she has reigned from 1972 until now. Um, Margaret was not, oh my God, was not born to be a monarch. At the time of her birth, only males could ascend the throne of Denmark, owing to the changes in succession laws enacted in the 1850s when the Glücksburg branch was chosen to succeed, as she had no brothers. It was assumed that her uncle, Prince Knut, would one day assume the throne. The process of changing the constitution constitution started in 1947, not long after her father ascended the throne as Frederick the Ninth, and it became clear that Queen Ingrid would have no more children. The popularity of Frederick and his daughters, and the more prominent role of women in Danish life, started the complicated process of altering the constitution. That proposal had to be passed by two parliaments in succession and then by a referendum which was held on the 27th Mar of March 1953. The new act of succession permitted female succession to the throne of Denmark according to male preference primogenitor, where a female can ascend to the throne only if she does not have a brother. Um, Princess Margaret therefore became the heiress presumptive. On her 18th birthday, 16th of April 19th, 
1858, the heiress presumptive was given a seat at the Council of State, and the princess subsequently chaired the meetings of the Council. That's not relevant. But yeah, she married, married a French diplomat, who is now known as the Prince of Denmark, Prince Henri, or Prince Henrik. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not really gonna go into more detail. She is loved as well by the Danes. Danes, um, no doubt about that. She has two sons. The first of which is called Prince Frederick, or Crown Prince Frederick. And he's gonna be king the day Margaret either um, abdicates or um, dies. He is very loved by the Danish population and he is very dreamy. <laughs> if I say so myself, he was born uh, in 1968. And as most of you know, especially Aussies, my Aussie listeners, he's married to a very gorgeous, beautiful, um, iconic um, Aussie, or is it New Zealander? No, Tasmanian? I don't know where she's from. She's from down under, and he's married to her, and her name is Mary, and she is so beautiful. And they have four children. Like I said before, they just had a couple of twins, a boy and a girl, and they had two before that. Their firstborn was a boy, and he's, of course, called Christian. And then they have a, a little girl as well, who is called Isabella. And they are both very adorable. I can remember uh, when he married Mary on the 14th of May in 2004, because I was off from school so that I could watch it, and I remember him crying in the church as he and she entered, and he was just very beautiful, and it was a grand, grand wedding, and it was watched all over the world, and yeah, if you want to see more, you can just Google them, and probably YouTube them as well, and you can see some more. I'm, I think I'm going to end the video now, because it's already an hour and 17 minutes long, so I think that's enough for now. I'm interested to see and hear whether or not this soft-spoken thing is working, but if not, then this has been a video about the Danish royal family. <laughs> and that's it. Long overdue request. But I hope you enjoyed it, and um, I hope you were relaxed, and I hope you learned something, <laughs> if you wanted to. Now, go to sleep, and um, I'll talk to you guys later, okay? Bye.